that, yeah, and that would, I, I mean, I, I don't see any problem getting that. I don't see that, because, because that's also something you really, you really want to do with it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, that, that's something we discussed on now. The other and, question is, why project ID and user ID? Why is it not just some random meta tag? Right? Well, project ID and user ID is a pretty is specific. It happens to be specific to a lot of OpenStack, but it's pretty specific. So now, why does it have to be project ID? Why can't it be like goat ID? Well, the word the uh, that's what I got on the buffer. That's what I got on the buffer. Yeah, well, I mean, I, well, hope, I hope so. But, but, but it, would that also mean that then you need sort of else that results this to the project ID and the user ID? Maybe. Yeah. Maybe not. So maybe I don't you care about. Maybe I don't care about the project ID. No, I mean, ah, maybe, it's not, quota, to, maybe it's not a user quota. Yeah, maybe it's not a user quota. 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 Maybe it's not a user that, that's exactly why, because because you are using the system in the warehouse, and that's that's why like, you are, you have to deal with the fact that after that time, I mean, I, I'm, 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 I'm saying that because I'm yeah. saying that because except you have other ways to tokenize, um, to token, I mean, to identify a specific a specific metadata, like you said, to be see the, the user and the project ID, but oh, it's managed in terms of Kuala. It's totally up to Cyber because if they want to have like hierarchical koalas, mm -hmm. if they want to have like grouping koalas and, and every strategy that they would then like, then would they have to do that? Potentially, every team has an asshole, so you have to move them. Yeah, so, so you have to, in other words, my, my, my team's asshole is called the user ID, but yours might be the project ID. Right? Yeah, or, well, or depending, your... depending, depending which level you are on, um, I mean, if you're in the, in the project, maybe you're wondering that uh, one of the users to make sure that they, they don't fuck up. The rest of them, yeah, or they, they don't allocate on your uh, coding entries, for example. And and then, in the, in the, in the, from the administrative point of view, you want to limit the project to say that oh, you you, you can only have this this amount of things. I understand, so, I understand that, but again, I, I agree, and I'm overthinking, but that <coughs> it's not always a user and it's not always a project. Now, the, so fact, the fact is that placement doesn't really care other than the fact that the key is called user ID and project ID. It's really just a UU ID and you can put anything there that has so, significance to yeah, you. Yeah, but what, what else but, is the user ID? I don't fucking know. It could be, I mean, who knows? But right? if you don't know, then you don't know. No, no, no. Exist. But it doesn't exist yet. It doesn't mean it never will. Um, no. I, I do have a question for you. Uh, you have an idea. How do you plan the... So, okay, so we are going to handle this on the side of the Excuse me, guys. Excuse me, guys. Guys, guys, guys. Can we, can we? Woo! Woo! Can we go to the next uh, topic? Okay. So, this will uh, cover the programmability support. Okay, hi hey guys, I'm Lee here. Uh, I, I work for Huawei Toronto Lab. Uh, mainly just focusing on uh, our accelerations for cloud uh, scenarios. So, why are we? Why do we need programmability support inside for FPGAs? Because uh, most right now, most cases FPGA are only used as ASIC chips, uh, and then we need to facilitate the reprogramming natures of FPGAs. Um, so the the key word is change. We need to change like. Uh, the supported platforms or frameworks uh, on, the, on the fly. And we also need to change the loaded function, functionalities on the fly. So basically, they refer to the static logic or user logic in the FPGA. So this is really specific to some FPGA designs. In, in case you guys have any questions, feel free to ask, because uh, uh, I don't assume everyone has the FPGA platform. Here's a question. It's going sure. to change why they call it static logic. Sorry? It's going to be reprogrammed. Why they call it static logic? Well, the, it's just a term that you usually don't change, but I mean, uh, to support different uh, runtimes or uh, uh, frameworks, you have to, you still have to change it. You need to be able to change from one static logic to another static logic. Right. Essentially, what I'm saying, orchestration does not reprogram, or somebody else does go reprogram. Uh, someone has to, has, has to reprogram it. 
Uh, but from cyborg point of view, it just provides the API. That up to whoever decides to use the API. It could be, uh, for instance, it could be some P level, uh, pass level, uh, uh, admin to, or ad some system admin to change, uh, change the stuff, right? Yeah. So we need to, as I said, we need to expose this to users by providing a set of APIs and standards. And so that the cloud admin need a portal to reprogram FPGAs to different functionality and framework. And applications need a portal to change the functions to accelerate. Also, some IP developers also need a portal to, to load the bitstream on the FPGA. So these are the three use cases. The IP developers need to... Oh, so sorry. Uh, IP is just say, uh, uh, the term in FPGA development, you develop the circuits. Yeah, I understand. Yeah. Why does IP developers need to program? Uh, in some DevOps scenario, that, uh, uh, for instance, in Xenix XDXL case, they uh, they could write their own. Uh, best, uh, some some develop, developers can just use the uh, cloud to de develop their own IPs, and they they load the IPs on onto the FPGA. I think it has to do with the user entry point. Yeah. So then it becomes the user logic. Yeah. So yeah. there's there's the <clears throat> the application developer is going to inject or going to use consume the bitstream, right? Mm -hmm. Whereas the IP developer is going to so contribute the yeah. bitstream. So once it's configured, they are essentially programming the users as if they are either administrator or a user. That's in that case, it's a user. As a user. Yeah. As a user. So it goes back to second user. So either got administrator or a user. It's a third rule beyond that. Uh, so yeah. The application developer, right? Right. Yeah, but they, they define the context for, for the FPGA as to to static and user context. So it's just a name it sounds like a name eventually in this case. Right. So the static region would be updated by the cloud admin. Yeah. The the user region would be updated by the IP developer. And the application developer would do neither update and just consume. That's what it sounds like. Uh, Are we right? Maybe. Yep. Yeah. Cool. Maybe Sunder, your question is that the application developer mm -hmm. need a portal, not the application themselves need a portal. Yeah. I would think a little different. For example, if you have a VM containing its own web streams and doing programming itself. Right. Right. Yep. So that's. That's what I call user program. You got a different word for it. Well, there would be you no. Know, well, it depends. Right? So, I think in this scenario, the user is never going to manage their own bit streams. Right. It's a hazard. Right? Mm -hmm. so if you have a, a, you know, a malicious bit stream, it has to be ingested first. Yep. Mm -hmm. And also, and also, the FPGA made things bad things. <laughs> yes, exactly the reason for ingestion. Oh. So, this, and I don't think I think we maybe need to just move on to actually the block diagram because it shows we're not actually discussing ingestion yet yeah. in this flow. We're actually only talking about how to get the bitstream out of the of the, the database and onto the FPGA. Yeah. There's a whole other So there's two, the two scenarios here, right? So one is uh, how to l let the uh, developers to publish their bitstreams, right? The, how the third party can put the bitstreams onto the marketplace for users to use. The second one is how the user can use it, right? It's over there already. It's been checked. It's, everything's okay. Mm -hmm. how, how can we let users to use it, right? So in this, uh, in this one here, we mainly talk about uh, the second case, which is we assume the bitstream is there. Uh, it's been checked. Uh, it's like totally valid bitstream. Now we, we, we put it somewhere, like in our case, glance. How are we going to let users use it? So that's... that's Mainly the second one, but we, we do have some ideas for the first one. We can discuss it later, but yeah, I mean, then we can move on to it. Yeah. Right. So we have proposed two things. First is a set of APIs to add it to Cyborg for the uh, reprogramming. Second one is we need a uh, standardized set of metadata uh, added to the bitstream images. 
uh, we probably will focus on the second one next, uh, sorry, the uh, uh, next day. Um, but we, let, let me move on to this one. So this is a, this is a REST API, how it looks like when you want, want to reprogram the APJ. So basically user provides the APJ UID, which point like which uh, ID is where this APJ is. And then the glance bitstream UID, which is the bitstream you want to load it onto the APJ. And then uh, you, you, do a, you do a put and then uh, this thing will happen. So, <laughs> <Cool>. <laughs> so, there's a, so this is that interface that you saw. The cyborg takes the call and then send the programming, uh, programming request to cyborg agent. And then the cyborg agent will go to the glance to download that bitstream and appropriate metadata and drivers because it should be a uh, package, uh, installation package, including the bitstream, drivers, some installation script, everything in, inside of a package here. And then retrieve it to, to the uh, hypervisor Oh, sorry, in the onto the uh, cyber agent, cyber agent, and then this agent will send this to the uh, vendor driver, which is uh, uh, vendor specific. For instance, Intel or Zenix could have their own drivers, and then they will unpack this package and then run, uh, load the bitstream, and then run the installation script, so like, to load all the drivers. Uh, th and this is where the the reprogram actually happens. Sorry, go ahead. I'm sorry, I didn't hear. Uh, the previous slide, the Python FPGA, it was only in a single region. It could be multiple regions the same as yeah, FPGA, right? But we, we haven't handled that yet. When you define the APIs, you can't mm -hmm. define at the level of what we are, where we are now. Or so, so, true where we need to be, right? Yeah, so, so right. I so, think we address it in the next slide. Oh, with the next. Okay. Oh. Oh. And, uh, <laughs> uh, okay. So, well, I mean, uh, let me just move on then. So, so I, 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 even the previous one, I'm not quite in the alignment of the previous diagram, so it's okay. Uh, when you're saying that we include drivers along the bridge stream, that's what it was our concept. So, a lot of different driver environments. Mm -hmm. Which one are going to, which kernel are they developing the driver for? We don't know which value we're going to apply here. Oh, those the, ones should be in the metadata uh, associated with this, with this image. And uh, we, we try to standardize how this metadata, metadata should look like so that each, each vendors could write their own drivers to, to recognize this metadata to load it, to, to load the appropriate drivers. So by combining what, what you're saying is, if you've got, let's say, IPC bit stream, like one version of, let's say, kernel version 3.16, mm -hmm. one for 4.1, one for 4.1, right? Every time the driver changes, there is a separate package for that. Yeah. Is that scalable? Uh, yeah. I have doubts because we have similar problems. In fact, I think your API could be generalized to be other than an FPGA. Our devices work in a similar manner. Um, and that creating an image, um, so tying your driver to your bitstream is going to explode really fast. Yes. You're going to make millions of images right away. Mm -hmm. It's not, and it's not just kernel versions, it's different OS versions. Yes. Yes. Different architectures. There's so many dimensions, and then you cross product all of those, and that's how many copies of your image you have to put in. Yeah, well, it depends on if you just point at the actual driver or if you actually bundle it. Yeah. The, the, if you, okay. but, it's, but it's also, it's also uh, an issue. If you then do regions, then you have essentially already a driver and a thing you're running there. And the, the, the other thing you want to point is a different driver, then you might just hold that. There's, there's also the matter of um, how, how people think, try to solve this with out of three kernel modules is with EKMS and stuff like that. Uh, it's, uh, I know. It's, that that, that kind, kind of goes to show exactly how painful this kind of thing is. Well, well stuff in main mind, people. I think we can, we can separate the concept <laughs> yes, of yeah. drivers here because we have a user driver, right? If we have a user function. Do you, can, can you do this without a kernel module? Because if you can do this. No, you need to have a kernel module, but the cloud administrator would be responsible. And I correct me if I'm wrong, I'm just kind of just going here. Um, the cloud administrator would be responsible to load the driver with the shell. So with mm -hmm. the static region. So there are only a finite, very finite number of mm -hmm. static regions you right. would actually deploy yeah. in your cloud. Right. Yeah. And the cloud administrator would be responsible to <clears throat> package that and have it be compatible with the images they yes. support. 
So yeah, but the question is also that is there a dependency between your your firmware or the, the driver and the actual images you deploy? Is there or are they completely separate? Mm -hmm. In all cases, no. Mm -hmm. Because if they're, if they're separate, then you only need the data. There's, there's, there's one data. problem you have with that, and that means that up, updates now become written. Because the cloud admin now has to ensure that the, um, that the updates for the kernels on the hypervisors are in lockstep with the updates on the advanced images for the, for the static region. Uh, unless they're just referenced. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> Well, uh, anyway, in, sorry, in, sorry, in, sorry. Assuming your case, you're actually controlling the entire environment, so you're controlling the kernel as well. Right. Um, yeah. Uh, it's a little bit harder for me, for example. <laughs> okay. So, I mean, in, oh, from what I understand, though, right? Yeah. So, I mainly deal with Xanax and features so far. Yeah. And, yeah. Uh, so, you guys load the kernel drivers for the shell, right? Yeah. And then, each time you load a bitstream on there, you should have some user drivers loaded on there associated with it. Right. Right. So this this user drivers should be associated with that history. Like they should link together as a package. Well, or is the ports? This is simple. This is this is a cheat. If you bundle the static drivers inside a VM image, and you pass the entire PCI device through. Then you're then you're not relying on anything on the host, mm -hmm. right? That's how I'm thinking. Yes. Yeah. And the VM program is right. But in that case, we don't want that to happen, right? We don't want the VM to actually no. program the VGAs. You 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 split that up as part yes. part of the boot system. So so in other words, you spin that up in a um, in a privileged mode mm -hmm. during during the hypervisor boot cycle. Mm -hmm. So it boots up and it gets passed through that PCI device. All the all the specific things happen. Mm -hmm. the, the the static uh, uh, static environment gets loaded and so on, and then it detaches, goes away, and it hands off control back to the to the host system. And now and now the the host system does not know what state that PCI device is in. But it can handle segments to the different to the different user. So you, you're saying we try to hot plug that uh, PCI device during programming. Oh, that's pretty easy with um, pass through with IO and U. Okay, yeah. 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 <coughs> I think all this kind of faster in my life. Yeah. He's got static logic and programming logic. Yeah. Program logic, let's say IP set, to take it from you. You need something user space to operate the IP set logic. That can bundle the VM image. The VMs may be highly varied, so it may have Ubuntu centers, all kind of stuff, right? So you have to match the driver to whatever you have in the VM. That's what actually tested with the sort of all validated. So it needs to come with the VM. Mm -hmm. Once you do that, it's not coupled to the bitstream anymore. Mm -hmm. There are two different things. Mm -hmm. One is tied to a VM image, other is tied to the SPG hardware. And orchestration is marrying both. So you're saying we prepare some VM images with the driver in there? Yes, mm -hmm. um, because when you create the VM for a particular function, let's say you're putting IP second there, you know what you need. Right. You want to know what function you want to offload. So you put the corresponding driver in there. So the, 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 the problem becomes, instead of bumping up the bitstream numbers, like the bitstream image numbers, you're bumping up the VM image numbers. It's right? already the case. No, you don't. You're not, you're not, um, you, 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 can, you can take the, the VM, has got the vendor driver in it, mm -hmm. and it has. Uh, and well, and vendor it, driver is not on VM. No, no, no. You put the vendor driver on the VM. You put the entire vendor driver on the VM because the vendor driver is going to speak directly to a PCI device that it thinks is connected to it. And you connect the glance image with the bitstream, on, with the separate bitstreams onto it. So the VM pops up, it sees two. Things. It sees the first, there's a volume with the with, with the bitstream image on it, and it sees, oh, here's a PCI device, and it goes plug the one into the other. So you don't need to rev your VMs up for every new bitstream image. Well, the problem is we don't want the VM to have access to the bitstream for security reasons. Well, depends yeah. on which bitstream we're talking about. That's I the think thing. it's talk about that. Yeah. No, 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 no. 
that's the thing. You only do this in a in a privileged mode that's not accessible from OpenStack's point of view. That oh, Cyborg does this as a as a privileged operation. But then, then every time you go to this room, you have to ask the user to enter this mode, right? Yeah, it's, 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 you lose the you lose the uh, like programmer like the nature of it, right? No, I see what you mean. To get the logic in the FPGA, there are two ways you can do it. Yeah. One is not to open stack at all, but some free program we're talking about. Do some means outside of open stack already got the image, mm -hmm. like shell clients or whatever. Second way is for the VM to do it, and then understand the security concerns there. Mm -hmm. It's a matter of implementation. We can talk about how to make it secure. You have to go through something in the post to actually get it done. Mm -hmm. It's not about the user driven mm -hmm. program. <coughs> Third one is orchestration driven, mm -hmm. where the user simply says, I want IPsec. An open stack is I'll find a free IP set for you. If not, I'm going to mm -hmm. find a free region, reprogram and give it to you. So all three models are possible. Yep. The most sophisticated one is orchestration driven program, so we want to get to it. But I believe there are some challenges in getting there. We need to solve some problems in Nova before that. Well, there is, but there is going to be like privileged layers that will need to be. Yes, for the user driven programming, there needs to be some privileged agent in the post which can gate the access. Yeah. yeah. So uh, actually, here is uh, we kicked the VM out of the picture already. Like mm -hmm. in this case, it's just a service. It's a reprogramming. Like it's a programming service in this uh, in this scenario. And this uh, probably will be some keystone layers here to check if the user has the ability to reprogram or to to program this and specific device. PGA in this case. Sorry. And owns the PGA in this case, so you don't go like, oh, I'll program. That one's right, right. <laughs> yeah, and then you, you want to check if the user already purchased this IP or not, right? It's like, so this is out, like VM is out of picture in this case. So we just provide an interface. So whoever has the ability to program, they can come here, program that device. Yeah. So in that case, though, uh, uh, in, during runtime in FPJ, say for instance, you have an application running on the VM. In that case, you can uh, uh, insert a shin layer into a runtime, which on a normal routine will actually talk to the PCI device, program it uh, as if you are on a hypervisor or on a host of bare metal. But in this case, you insert a shin layer, which actually does this like rest call for you, mm -hmm. instead of you actually going to the uh, uh, PCI device. In that case, it will, it will be transparent, totally transparent to, uh, to the application on the upper, layer, upper stream, right? In that case, it was just, for, for them, it's just, it's just the same as if you're using a, a bare, metal, bare metal FPGA. Except the, except the fact that you need to, you know, to manage the application credentials, which is kind of a bit tricky and a, a long standing issue in, with, with some other projects. I mean, I, I, I get what you're saying, but the fact that Cyborg API has both credentials for administrators to manage the data manage the discovery and, and, and the creation of those resources and the management of users, application users to, uh, to reprogram the FPGAs. It's possible, but it's like super huge. Mm -hmm. because, because you actually need, for example, say, as a user, I want to know about something. I, 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 I don't have the whole workflow uh, that you guys have for attaching the specific PCI device to the, uh, to the instance. So I guess it's probably something that you manage yourself. I mean, I, I don't know what you say. Um, as a user, I want, to, I want to get a specific H4G accelerated resource. Is um, that true or favor? Is that? Are you? Are you, are you uh, my, sorry, my, my, my question is about the user workflow. So I, I'm, I'm an operator, I have some FPGA accelerated resources that I want to offer to my users, okay? Uh, so I go through the Cyborg API, and then I, for example, I make eight of those available to the users. Uh, that was the question I was having uh, just before we started. How do you make those resources available to the users in terms of user requests? Yes, exactly. Yeah, okay, but, <laughs> oh. How do you how do you plan to express that on the boot request? Who a flavor? Who some hints? Who some? Uh, do you plan to manage that through the Cyborg API? Yeah. Yeah. 
you, uh, I'm, do, do you want me to rephrase the question? Uh, okay, sure. Um, okay, I, I will try to be uh, as super, uh, as super, as super direct as I can be. So I uh, sorry about my French. <laughs> 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 I know. Um, okay. So uh, I just discovered Cyborg like two years, two or two years, two two hours, two hours ago. So I apologize for for any uh, for any stupid question. Um, I'm an operator. I'm running Cyborg that is able to identify some accelerators that I can offer to my users. That I understand. For some reason, you have the resource management that is done through the placement API, and that I'm totally okay with that. Now, through Cyborg, you have some kind of API that tells you, for example, for that specific, I don't want to talk about resource provider, but I would say for that specific hyperlizer, or for that specific compute node, you have those accelerators. That I still understand. By some action, the user has to request for those specific resources. Mm -hmm. Like, for example, I want to, uh, I'm still taking the, 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 the Cinder use case as, a, as an analogy. Um, as a user, I ask Cinder to create me a volume, and I ask Nova or Cinder to attach, to attach my volume to my instance. My question is, how do you plan to attach that specific accelerator, because that's the same as to that specific guest, to that specific instance? I think that's, that's done with on, on instance creation. That's so done on instance creation, that I, I got it. To the mm -hmm. For the flavor. Yeah, yeah two X plus plus ask for I'm not sure if we have that today, but that we should be is ask for a custom resource for just an as you said. So you ask for the go to regular placement API. Cyborg has already advertised resources to placement API. So you're going to the regular scheduling process to find all the resource RP3, the compute nodes and the resource where it's deployed in the source class. You return the list of this RP3 back to the scheduler, go to the filter and wait just like a regular process. Take a host, it comes to the compute node, now you've got to answer whatever you want. And what happens on the compute node is assigning the agile data to the VM, it's up to the implementation. When you take a PCI device and assign it, it, it could be a PF or a VF, it cannot be asked, sorry, it could be some PCI device. But assign that to the VM. So you have Yes. And in this case, then also that would be programming, the to, programming of it by external means. Yeah. Okay. Um, do you do you program it before it's attached? Uh, in this case, it was uh, both. Okay. But what, what I mean is, do you program it on 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 um, instance boot? Uh, well, that's no. one of the scenarios. Ah, uh, well, potentially. Yeah. So so there's one because in in this case, it was more of a uh, you you basically tell your host host to to program it for you as a security measure. Because yep. you can only program known data. Yes. Uh, well, can I ask a question? The two scenarios. The one is like um, an operator has uh, some applications that need to be deployed into the FPGAs, and he's not writing the HDL or some kind of hardware description language. The second scenario is the <coughs> user who's writing some uh, HDL that's becoming IP as like the units or whatever, um, and then they also want to program that dynamically while they're developing it. Yeah, is that the other? Yeah. That's scenarios? one of the yeah. use cases. So that's one, that's and then the third one is this: is a VM that boots up and says, "I want something that has been programmed with this. I just need to speak to exactly. that function somewhere. Mm -hmm. I'm not going to write anything on that." And then, then that should be handled by by uh, Cyber in that case as well. Yeah. So either allocate one of the already existing ones yeah. or or make it new. Right. So program a new one and yeah. then give it. To so the a bit background system. here, though. Uh, I think both Linux and Intel are doing the same similar thing. Uh, they have, for each FPGA that's attached to it, they should have two PFs, uh, physical functions. One is dedicated for 
loading bedrooms like management. Yeah. The other one is dedicated for user space. So it's like other band control. Yeah. yeah. So right, right. I'm, I'm right. Uh, Intel is doing similar. Based on the known yeah, oh, yeah, right. yeah. Oh, Sorry. <laughs> yeah. So yeah. So in that case, I think this is quite standard way of separating management and data plane uh, use cases. So in that case, we only pass through the data PF to the VM. And then the, 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 the management PF, PF will stay on the, with the hypervisor. And they're exposed by this uh, API through the vendor drivers. In the data center context, you can think of a PGS or PCA device. Management exposed to the PF. <coughs> the adjuncts could be exposed through VSQL SRA support. If you don't have it, it exposed to other PCA functions too. And, and, and the management PF driver is not necessarily in tree, in kernel tree. Well, it's installed on. Uh, yeah, but it's yeah, the but module. It's that's the module that you want to load in the glance images. Or is that you don't want you don't want you, you don't want to load the management PF drivers onto the PF, right? Is management. the driver that's associated with the bitstream the driver that will be used on the management PF or on the other PF? Other one. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So by the user or the, the, the consumer PF. What are we finding the IP set to? IP set will be exposed to PF or the VF. Mm. That is the data plane PCA function. Right, okay. That makes sense. Okay. I would say it would be the management job because that's where you flash the SPJ. But the programming goes to the management, whether yeah. it's through orchestration or user or whatever. <coughs> assignment of the yeah. as related to the VM has to be through some yeah. isolated path. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So when when you when you tell when you use this thing you you tell it yeah I want to now deploy this block here it it will load a driver and all of that thing so that will be handled behind your VM so to speak because your VM will not see it until it's done and you have function that's presented. Yes, yes. yes. So it's more so, specific, the driver he's talking about is a driver for the IP set. Not the PGA. Okay, okay, yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Ah, okay, yeah. then I get it. Okay. Yeah. I thought it was a driver for the PGA, not the oh, driver for oh, okay. the Okay. Yeah, that's why when I was asking about the scalability concern, I was assuming you meant the driver for the management PF. No, no, no. Okay. So so now we're now we're understanding. Uh, now we're on the same page. <laughs> sorry, sorry. Probably it's some uh, I'm missing some piece on my slides. No, it, well no, it's it's complex. Yeah. yeah. There's multiple drivers. Yeah. Yeah. What does he mean? <laughs> exactly. So, yeah. my question is kind of basic. Like, we spoke to three different kinds of programming models: like free program, user-driven program, and orchestration program. Uh -huh. Now, you're essentially presenting a different fourth model that somebody just writes to Cyborg REST API and says, "Just go and directly program it for me." Well, because this is more generic, right? All the three cases you talked about can use this API. Yeah. yeah. Right. It seems like this API could be further generic, generalized to other devices yeah. as well. So any of the cases you talked about, you could use, utilize this API. Need program to use it. User program will not must go to this model, right? Because essentially you're running a VM. VM is running, let's say, some open state application multiple kernels. Right. It wants to keep reprogramming the region. Then they the keep asking the, then you have to modify the runtime to be able to talk with this API. Yeah. To do the root program. So they need to essentially write a daemon in order to program that when their application calls it to the flexible screen. It has to do that to the request to the program. What is the guess? In the guess. And that's okay, I guess. Yeah. Well, yeah. well, listen, you know, they have to uh, go back into the cloud. Right. That's, that's, well, yeah. yeah. I mean, there are a couple of open stack projects that aim to do the same, so I would uh, say it's a it's a common it's a common use case, but it's a big deal. Yeah. That's how we make it a service, right? Yeah. yeah. Mm. That's perfectly accepted. Okay, great. That's what I want to hear. Everybody disagrees. It's perfect. One thing that you need is separating the bio from the bitstream. Yeah, 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 that's that's different. The bitstream, yeah, like yeah. the driver, the driver associated with the bitstream is only a user driver. Right? Uh, yes, yeah. and, and so that should still not be yes. packaged with the bitstream itself. It's still independent thing. Yeah. It um, goes with the VM image, all the container image for that matter. Uh, you mean like the bitstream and the driver should be separate? Yes. Why? 
because the driver depends on which ml and deploying it. Yes. Well, yeah, but that's the, the any of the vendors problem. Screw them. Next topic. I have my doubts about the driver packaging. But I'm just not exactly sure how to solve it. So, so that's an OS level problem on the guest OS. Right, which you could have, as you propose, just a image. You can have, you can decide, you can decide really for yourself. Because the thing is, you, you're actually developing hardware there. And when you're developing hardware, you also have to have the match, to the driver match to that. Mm -hmm. and, and the only way you'll get... Uh, uh, the only way you, you you get that thing upstream is, is if, if they have a standard or something like that. Say, for example, you decide to get your FDA to emulate a um, generic video card, something like that, and then you've got your generic video card loaded up in your kernel, you're fine. But say you want to develop something else, that's, that's absolutely no problem because you're actually doing kernel development there and kernel development here. It's up to you to, as shipping the OS in the VM, yeah. to maintain that OS in the VM. And if, if, if you decide to go out of tree, that's your choice. Yeah. 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 You are not going to ship it with the driver firmware or whatever. Yeah. You ship the hardware, you ship the software separately. Yeah. So it will be created to put the right driver. But, but, but in this case, I would actually separate, I would separate that the driver yeah. so you can have multiple versions of the driver, but the driver is the same for the bitstream. Yeah. So you have like, like so for, from the bitstream, you can have like a manifest that says that I, you want driver XYZ or SHA, and then you can get the, the, the SHA of that for right. the, for the, the installation running. script you can handle. You yeah, can even exactly. go keep clone exactly. and then download that driver the, the, the from the only thing from is static the bundle you should actually have something where you can fetch it on the side right. and then you're done. Yes. Right. So you could just have like a reference to the driver's user exactly. ID in the dual bundle yeah. and then you can go and grab it later. Yeah, it already because we can have like for instance we just agree on the uh Installation script, like yeah. say yeah. script dot sh, right, and then yeah. we, we untar the package, load the bitstream, run that script, and then the vendor can put whatever they want, yeah, specific to this bitstream, yeah, to set that everything for you. That's actually not important. You just have those things that you can use. Yeah. yeah, I mean, yeah. I don't know. It's, what so, it's more like a semi cloud unit, yeah. like, yeah. but you can run it outside the cloud unit. Yeah. Basis, basically. You can even do DKMS. Yeah. <clears throat> no question, but why, why can't you just assume that the drivers in your guest image if they're using a particular the words are said about that. FPGA? Well, <coughs> FPGA configured. Then, because uh, as we discussed, if you put it in there, it's fine. Yeah, you can totally do that. But we're talking about the case where you want to change yeah. the stuff on the fly, right? For instance, you, you, you have an image prepared for IPsec, and then you load it on, you put it up, prepare everything, there you go. But now all of a sudden, okay, I want to change <coughs> this feature to code that, some image. Okay. So your, your image, your instance already exists. Yeah. And then you, you want, want to change update it. a running instance, or you want to update all future instances that you create? Sorry? You want to, you want to modify it. You want, you want to modify it. Exists. You want to modify it. But, but, doesn't that sound like an orchestration thing for your guests, an orchestration issue? Because uh, that's, uh, but in some cases, for instance, the, uh, the application developers wants to change it. It doesn't have to be orchestrator. Yeah. Right. So, so you detach the ports and reattach it with newer? Mm. Yeah. Like, like, like the, like the new you mean like the user PF? That yeah. 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 You, you go and you say, detach this VM. And the IONU detaches it, and then you say attach it, but with this new version. And then Sago goes and does the flashing. Uh, no, it's not you could export single VM or single PCA function. It's abstracting a generic accelerator. So mm. the so when you reprogram, the MIO maps the PCA address space may change. Assuming you've got the right drivers for it, you can handle it. If that's what VM is designed. 
So you don't have to do it. You could do it if you want to, but it's not absolutely necessary. Yeah. So like, what, like, um, fixing or changing your tire while the car is driving? <laughs> uh, kind of. Well, yes. you, you are changing logic, but as long as the PCA address space is well visible, as long as that stays in a visible yes. form, it is. Right. Yeah. It sounds like we're making many assumptions about people doing the right thing. Wow. Well, there is a partial reconfiguration feature many, many FPGA vendors support. So basically, you don't need to detach your PCIe device. You just reprogram the user logic yeah. and you can start using it without detaching or reattaching device. But you could also, you could also have, a, for example, if you, if you do this and you have the manifest, you could have a flag that says that we actually changed something very important. So you need to detach. Um, for example, the way I think the world is providing mechanisms. Yeah. How the user uses up to them. He can very well shoot himself in the foot. Yeah, yeah, but you could, you could, you could, you could if, with this, you could either say that you don't need to detach or reattach, or you could say that I need to be detach or reattach. Well, because what? you can't express it as, as if, you don't, if you don't have that possibility, you can't express it. And if you can't express it, then you're up to the at some point in your life, and you're sitting there, where the hell is my pal? Yeah. Uh, that's potentially doable, but it depends whether you have a hot plug-in support or not. Yeah. And I also, I don't like that flow from the user perspective. I would say that they, if they want a new functionality on the PCI endpoint, they need to re-enumerate the device, which means they need to request another device. Okay. But I don't know if Intel, see that's the thing that I'm struggling with here. If the Intel programming paradigm is the same, I don't know. I'm thinking of generic open serial application you can program different kernels in the same application. Right? But if you're adding different VFs, so are you, when are you adding a VF? Like, a, are you adding it on on user request or on uh, instance request? On the on the, the instance request, so the instance was boots up, you're assigning a VF to it, and subsequently through the VF you can make requests to the host to have the underlying thing changed. And if you do that, it's up to you to make sure that the changed PCI map is still something you can handle. So if that, the, the PCI map, when the IOM MMU attaches it to the PCI device, up to with pass through, it exchanges a number of PCI regions. And if either device writes out of, outside of that region, you, the IOM MMU stops that. Or if your, your VM writes outside of, outside of those regions, it stops that as well. So that, that helps you with, uh, with isolation. But if you, if you decide to add more regions, I'm not sure if that's dynamically possible. I know you can, you can, you can move all the regions up in when you attach it. When you pass a VF through the VM, yeah. through the EPT mechanism mapping the MIO space. Yes. That's why I want to use this EPT. Oh, yeah. DMA goes to IOM and you. Yeah, yeah. Third thing is the interrupt also goes to the. The, 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 there. You, you cannot change it randomly. That's true. Yeah. If you're randomly only changing the user logs, you shouldn't change the PCI like, like layout. Yeah, if the PCI layout is, is static, then you don't need to detach and be attached. Right. Right. Because yeah. I, I assume like if you're only changing user logic. So, you so the, nor the normal case in that, in that case is that you don't uh, detach and reattach. And then you need to have like one flag that says detach and reattach. <coughs> yeah. Only if you want to change yeah. the static if, if, if piece of, right. then you have to detach it. Yeah. Yeah. So, so I understand what what is the significant advantage here of like doing this stuff on the fly is what I think what we were suggesting where you have another device that you attach that and then you go and detach that. So the analogy of changing tires while the car is moving, you add an additional two tires and then you pop up the ones that you no longer care about. Rather than reprogramming your your FPGA and moving stuff about, is it that, speed? Is it, is it speed? Is it, how long does it take? Does it take a few milliseconds or so to flash it? Beyond the speed, what's the question? The application complexity. Right? 
generally in FPGAs, so if you look at GPUs, they're loading, going open serial through a GPU mm -hmm. with multiple kernels, we you keep changing the PCA function all the time. Mm -hmm. So this is the same thing, right? Then it should work with FPGA with some caveats. Mm -hmm. The caveats are there, but the application programming model is the same. We are using open serial in FPGA. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. So well, I have some other things I, I plan for tomorrow, so I will save it for, for tomorrow. Okay. All right. okay. So that's it for me. Thank you, guys. Okay. Okay. Thank you. We have a few other things that we want to look at. Do you want to take it on the same program? Do you want to look at the other panel? Okay. Okay, so uh, for some reason, comes up all in blue. You know, I, I find it difficult to read. <laughs> <laughs> oh. Yeah, that's that's tricky. <laughs> If you want to get rid of the blue in some way and find it, then I, I think, um, yeah, okay. yes, all okay. right. Uh, a lot of things I wrote in there. You want me to condense that in some form? So broadly, I'm saying three things here. If you look at programmability, there are three things that it considers. One is security mm -hmm. of the images, uh, both at rest and in use. When you're storing it in a repository, you have to provide for either authentication or encryption. Mm -hmm. When it is being transferred from the repository to the computer to the program, that again, it, the in-flight, the, during the transfer, we need to make sure the image is protected. Yeah. Those are two things to consider. Secondly, when you're in a typical cloud, when you apply these images, there could be considerations of some policies or licensing or whatever, right? Yeah. These are, I'm suggesting here should be outside the purview of cyber. I mean, in, in my opinion, like, the bitstream should be totally out of the hand. There, there we have the third, third thing for the code engine. <laughs> I see. I, sorry. I see. I see. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Third thing is, in terms of where you actually store it, Glance is the obvious preferred solution for OpenStack, but apparently some people have already developed their own proprietary solutions. We want to give them a path to migrate to OpenStack. If they want to adopt to OpenStack in the future, it would be good to have some standardized APIs so they can change one component at a time and slowly migrate to OpenStack. Yeah, just uh, a question for the API for the application or encryption. Are you, are you thinking of Barbican? I am not even going to anything specific okay. like that. All I'm saying here is that really consider these things. When you do that, for security, for things like authentication and encryption, okay. different cloud operators may want different key lengths, for example. Yeah, but uh, Barbican is just a key manager. So it, it has different back backends. Okay. You can use dog type for PIP, PIP, you can do something else for PIP, you can also have the special hardware encryption. I'd so say you, you have the, the, the keys are stored in a separate unit that you can never retrieve them, retrieve them again, but you can actually communicate them. <coughs> okay, for key storage. Yeah, so, so key storage and key management. Sure, yes. That, that so it becomes like a write. Sure. Okay. However, the, the FPGA driver has to be involved actually decrypting it. Either the hardware itself does it, yeah. All the FPG stack that's it's kind of render the code. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Right. So that cyber can provide some mechanisms for it, but it's not but question is it should be should not probably mandate anything in the area. Okay. Uh, what, 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 what,
what I what I think just uh, uh, briefly is uh, not coming from the FPJ area at all. Is if you have the image crypto, then you may basically just need some kind of a signature or a checksum of the image to make sure it hasn't been modified. Yeah. Uh, right. Fingerprints. Yeah, some kind of fingerprint that says that it hasn't been modified. In the end, so, so you, you have a crypto image, you can access the crypto image, and then this final verification step could be some kind of thing. Sure. Yeah. Absolutely, yes. Yeah. I think we're suggesting we offload all of that. Okay. <laughs> yes, exactly. And the cloud operator. Right, that's what we mean. <laughs> so can we reverse that again? <laughs> well, I think that it's hard to think like that because each cloud is going to be very big. Yeah, but that's also where I, I suggest a key management, and then you can employ that or use that in whatever way you want at the end. Because 